Anybody do the homework? So what's the answer? It sounds like they used a fixed number of flavors all the way down. Yeah, and that's four. And three. So remember the question for those of you who are guys, what is lambda QCE at one loop in perturbation theory using alpha at the z-fold mass of your starting point? So give you a hint. That's getting in the right direction. When you run the coupling down from the z fold mass to the b coil mass, you have to use five fermion flavor. So there's five dynamical quarks who contribute to the beta function. Then the convention is once you hit the b quark mass, below the b quark mass, you use only four flavors because the b quark becomes heavy no longer participates in the beta function. So you have to match alpha strong at MB plus to MB minus with different numbers of fermion flavor. And then keep running down this way until you find the value where alpha flips and zero. Does that make sense? All right. So let's talk about fermions a little more. Fermion discretization. So we're going to start with the free field. So recall we have these two derivative operators. We'll take a note for forward. Determine what is this, uh, what do these difference operators look like in momentum space, and what is the fermion propagator? So, how do we determine these in momentum space? Well, I didn't stress this, but we're always going to assume we have boundary conditions which are preserved translation invariants. So, in that case, it means periodic boundary conditions. So, if you have translation invariants, that means you have momentum conservation. And if you remember from quantum mechanics, the momentum operator is the translation operator. So you can look at this and immediately realize without any work to, this is part of the point of being a physicist is you always come up with a way to make your life as easy as possible because you're inherently lazy, right? You don't want to work hard. You work, you work incredibly hard so that you don't have to work hard. That's the goal of life. So the point is you can immediately tell what the momentum space uh, version of this difference operator has to be. Because here we've translated in just plus one unit. The momentum operator is the translation operator. So therefore, in momentum space, this must be e to the i p a, we'll call it p mu, because we're going in the mu direction, by one unit. And then here, Nothing happens. We didn't translate. Does that make sense? So it's a simple shift forward by one unit. The momentum operator is the operator that does that. Okay. And similarly, the backwards operator. Now we've gone backwards. Oops. So that's the difference operator in momentum space. 
So then we can combine them. Remember, we want this symmetric derivative. We want this symmetric derivative because this is an anti Hermitian operator, which is a property the continuum derivative operator has. We want to preserve the anti Hermeticity. And again, it's anti Hermitian because we're going to be flipping the space. And you'll recognize right away this is a sine function. The derivative in the discretized derivative is a sign in the Meissner space. Okay. So then, if we say, what is the behavior of this derivative near the continuum limit? We can consider the limit again. A goes to zero, and we see this gets exactly what we expect. I'll just call this. Uh, I'll call it. Call it D mu tilde. The limit of this operator the limit of this operator gets us to as A is small, we just get from the leading term of the sine expansion is just the coefficient. We get I over A times A to U, which is I to U. It's exactly what you want. And so then the fermion propagator, I won't work this out, but you can show the fermion propagator. So recall the fermion propagator is uh, related to the inverse of the operator in the action. So our action is some operator x, y. And so the fermion propagator Related to the inverse of this operator. And what you can show is in momentum space, this is I over S mu gamma mu plus M. And I forgot the factor of I. Uh, and I put in too many powers of I. So this is a 1 over I S mu plus N, where S mu is 1, let's get my normal one, yeah, 1 over a sine a t mu. So then you can complete the square like normal, and we get minus i s mu gamma mu plus m over s mu squared uh, plus m squared. So this is exactly what you do, you know, in the continuum theory. You look at the propagator, put the uh, matrix upstairs. But now it's great that near the continuum limit, this behaves as you expect. But as you know, uh, sine functions have multiple zeros, and so there's another zero or another place where you would get a pole out of this equation. So if you look back at the sine, of course. Imagine the momentum is near pi over a. So I didn't tell you before, but the maximum allowed momentum is pi over a allowed p max. So if you consider momentum modes near the max, you see the sine function goes to zero again. So what is that? So if you imagine expanding, say, k mu equals pi over a minus p mu, then you get another mode that has a continuum dispersion in it. Right? So then sine of a p mu Maybe I want a little more. I, I got a sign wrong here. Well, okay, up 
up to the side, I don't really care about. point is, this is just minus sine over A of A k here. So again, as you take A goes to zero, you find a mode that has a continuum-like dispersion relation. What does that mean? It means you thought you put down one fermion, which has the pole and low momentum, but you got a second one that you didn't want. This is called fermion doubling. So it turns out your naive method you might think to apply to stick a stick of fermion onto the lattice produces a doubling of fermion. And that's no good because it turns out it doesn't just produce two. But if you, you put down one fermion on the lattice, this corresponds to two to the D fermions in the continuum. where d is the space-time dimension. So for d equals 4, you get 16 low energy degrees of freedom. And as you know, QCD doesn't have 16. It only has up, down, and strains. And sometimes people put a charm, but that's only 4. So this is a problem. It's actually pretty easy to understand when it comes about. <coughs> If you consider this difference operator, which produces us this, this sign, so let's see. Uh, I haven't written it in a form that's abundantly obvious <coughs> yet, but if you consider that difference operator, <coughs> so before I put it in momentum space, if I just look at this definition, remember it's one over two a sine of x plus a mu minus sine of x minus a mu. And so if you imagine looking at the possible modes on your lattice, so here I'll just examine one direction, call it x, and these are the discrete points. So this is a, 2a, 3a, and so on. And you look at the modes on the lattice. If you look at the uh, lowest energy mode, so here if I just look at the momentum, the lowest energy mode will be one with no wiggles at all, right? And if you look at the difference operator, it's comparing this point to this point. So you get zero if you subtract the value of the momentum here and here. So if I call this the momentum. So P of 3A minus P of K is zero. But then if you consider the maximum momentum mode, so here, this is called as pi over a, minus pi over a. And one side says up here, the next side, the maximum momentum is gonna be down here, and the next side is gonna be up here, and down here, and so forth. So the maximum momentum mode allowed, if you look at the difference operator, so this is min, if you look at P 3A max minus P of A max, this is also equal to zero. So the problem is that we have, you know, fermion has only a single derivative in the Lagrangian. And that's what's causing us this problem. So if you looked at a boson theory, there'd be terms that cared about this middle point as well. So it's precisely because we have only a single derivative for the fermion that causes this problem. And you can't, the difference operator can't tell the difference between the minimum and the maximum allowed mode on the lattice. Okay. So the solution to this problem comes from Wilson as well. And it was never published, I believe it was just in the proceedings from a talk. They're known as Wilson fermions. So if you look again in the momentum space, uh, proper, or difference operator, uh, what we can do is we can add a new operator, which is the product of the forward and the backward derivatives. And this operator you can show 1 over a squared of e to the i, q 
means a minus one, one minus e to the minus i b a. And you can work it out and show that this is two over a cosine of a p mu. So the problem, remember, occurs when the momentum is the order of pi over a. So at that point, cosine becomes minus one. So it doesn't vanish. So if we add this operator to our theory, it removes these doubling loads. Okay? And you can see, uh, what do I do? We can see that this is a perfectly fine thing to do because if we consider the full Dirac operator, all we're doing is adding a term that vanishes in the continuum limit. And again, the theory is only defined rigorously as we take the continuum limit. So we're free to add as many terms as we want that vanish with high powers of the lattice spacing. So the Wilson Fermat operator becomes this. So as you take the continuum limit, this is an irrelevant operator. That's okay. So what it does is it lifts the modes that are the doublers so they become heavy. And in fact, they have a mass that scales like one over the lattice spacing you can show. And so they decouple from the theory. As you take the continuum limit, they become irrelevant high energy modes that decouple from the theory. But uh, there's a problem with this new term. So if I look at the full or I should add in the mass term as well. If, if you notice, the regular derivative operator is chirally symmetric. The mass term, you'll know, is not chirally symmetric. This causes a mixing between the left and the right-handed modes, and that's because it doesn't have a gamma mu. This operator also doesn't have a gamma mu. So this operator is also going to break chiral symmetry explicitly. And so the problem is we know the up and the down quarks are light. And you know when you do continuum perturbation theory, dimensional regularization is the regularization of choice precisely because it's a multiplicative mass normalization scheme. So it protects the quark mass from additive correction. Right? And it's great on pen and paper, but it doesn't work on the computer. On the computer, the first solution we have, and actually it's still one of the most popular schemes, is to add a regularization method that explicitly breaks chiral symmetry. So you can see the problem. We haven't added the gluons yet, but when you add the gluons to these operators, there will be some high momentum modes that scale like pi over a. So the combination scales like pi over a squared times a. So this scales like 1 over a. So you've introduced a fine-tuning problem. So what you have to do to get light fermions is you have to very carefully tune the mass parameter. Turns out that's a problem we've been dealing with since the 80s. We know how to do that. It's OK. Uh, but you do have to be aware it can make your life difficult. OK. So now what we want to do is put all these ingredients together and write down the complete lattice action. And so remember. We want to use all operators that are gauge invariant. So basically, we just add every operator we need that's gauge invariant. So if we recall, the gluon action, actually I didn't write it down for you yet, but it turns out you can express the gluon action in the following way. So we have 2NC over G0 squared. This is just a normalization convention. You're going to have a sum over all space time, a sum over all mu less than mu in this case, and you want 1 minus the real part of the trace of this plaquette mu nu. So if you looked at the behavior of this u mu nu, you would call this in graphically was this object. So this is the real thing you want to take the continuum limit of, and you'll see 
the disk will produce for you the blue on the field strength tensor. And then we have our formatted action. Uh, so here I'm trying to be careful to include all explicit lattice spacing scales. So here we have psi bar x. Some will be mu. We have a Wilson operator, which depends on mu. I'll we'll just write it that way. Plus, we'll be very careful here to write m0. Or, okay. I screwed up my notation. D, W, plus m0. And here I've already included m0 and dw, so I won't write it again. DW is this operator here with gauge covariant derivatives, not just regular difference operators, but the full gauge covariant derivative that we remember those from the last lecture. And so then the QCD action, we'll call it the lattice QCD action, is just the sum of the gluon plus the fermion action. And then here I put an explicit a to the fourth because all these fields are dimensionful, so here, this mu is just a matrix, remember, it's just a set of numbers. So it's only when you expand the gauge length, remember mu, mu of x is e to the i, a, g, a mu of x. So this is the dimensionful gluon field. Here's the gauge coupling. As I've defined the action, actually what I should do is I've absorbed this coupling g inside of a, which you may remember from continuing QCD, you can do that. That produces the one over g squared. Uh, so this is a dimensionless set of matrices. Here, remember your fermions are dimension three halves. The difference operator is dimension one, so we have dimension four. The action has to be dimensionless, so we know we need an a to the four. So here I've kept track of all the explicit scales. All right, now, another point I just want to make is this gluon action is not unique. You're allowed to use any gauge invariant operator. So for example, you could have instead used something you might call R mu nu, a staple, not a staple, a rectangular quartet. So you're free to use something like this instead of this quartet. You're free to use both in some linear combination. The point is, these will both produce for you QCD in the continuum with different discretization errors. And so in fact, there's a, a serious effort uh, that goes into taking linear combinations of, for example, these two uh, operators to minimize the discretization. That's in broad, called uh, improved actions. All right, any questions about this? We're going to switch topics a little. A lot of questions. No, any questions? <coughs> this is the QCD, the lattice QCD action. And just to drive home the point, remember, the correlation function of interest, which I'll just write as some generic operator O, is defined the limit a goes to zero, the limit the number of configurations goes to infinity, and we have to take the volume to infinity. So there's three limits we have to take, well four. We also have to take quark masses to the physical value. So we have four limits we have to do of some lattice QCD operator between lattice QCD fits, where this is the QCD thing of interest. And that is the sum of it all. It looks very simple. It takes massive computing effort, and it takes lots of homework, but it can be done, and it is done all the time. All right, so. You mentioned it, A temperature second pole will give it an oscillating wave function. So if 
So the second pole is not oscillating. Not really the point is the difference operator can't tell it's oscillating. But I wonder, because when you do, do the Levy's integration, you, you use the, the pass integral, right? So if it is some way function oscillating, press the knob, basically you can switch with the out. Um, I'm not sure whether this is uh, near but I'm pretty clear. No, no, so the point is this, the difference operator can't tell that it's oscillating. So the difference operator, it's indistinguishable the, the flat mode and the highest oscillating mode. Right. And in fact, it's even worse in some sense, better or worse, depending on how you look at it. If you think you put a right-handed fermion in the low momentum region, it turns out the doubling mode is going to be left-handed fermion. But you could very quickly say the two-point function, if we want to cater the, the wave function to the side-side side bond function, then, then I can tell whether it's a side is oscillating or not. It's not side, it's the momentum. Right? I mean, the, the two-point two wave function. You can tell because in your head you see the oscillation. Yeah, yeah, right. But my point is this difference operator cannot tell. Right, but the, the, the object, they are going to be average can tell that. This is the appear in the um, action. So the, the operator, I want to consider, I want to capture the operator. So how do you put that operator on the computer? That's the hard part. Right. So one thing you could do is just, I mean, you could instead just take, uh, so first of all, okay, this dispersion relation is a function of P. The continuum dispersion relation looks like this. This dispersion relation looks like that. So you could say, well, let me instead just take the continuum dispersion relation and Fourier transform that. Why can't I put that on the computer? Well, you can, but the problem is that's not an anti-evolution operator. And you're going to have a huge force term at the edge of the lattice. And so it's going to screw up a whole bunch of other things. So the, the point, yeah, people have invested a tremendous amount of effort into coming up with an operator that can tell the difference. And so that, there's a long set of literature on how do you actually add chiral fermions onto the lattice, which is at the heart how do you construct a difference operator that respects the continuous dispersion relation and chiral symmetry at the same time. And it's very hard. There's solutions. They're numerically one to two orders of magnitude more expensive than this Wilson method. Yeah, if you can come up with a new way, you will be famous in the lattice community. <laughs> I don't know what out outside, but. Okay, so now that is the action. How do we actually get physics out of this stuff? So the first thing I want to talk about is two point correlation functions. So getting to the physics. And when I say two-point correlation function, I'm thinking in a position space language. What I really mean is you have a vacuum, you take the time order product of some operator at space time point y, some creation operator at space time point x. What is this object? So that's what I mean by two points. There's two different space time points. Okay. So let me first just say that y zero is greater than x zero, so I can ignore the time order. Now, the first thing we want to do is insert here a complete set of states in the form, and here, just because this caused confusion before, when I write, you're used to seeing this Keck bra from quantum mechanics, and again, like I said, we're lazy, so N, X, N. That's, <laughs> so if you're that's what I'm always writing. Okay. So you insert the complete set of